Well, hello. I'm Eliza Jones, and for as long as I can remember, people have been telling me that I should turn my wildly detailed dreams into short stories. Just for fun, I like to interpret my dreams, and some of the results are weirdly accurate, outrageous, or funny. With my tongue firmly in cheek, I'll share these dreams and interpretations with you, along with superstitions, astrology, and other paranormal things. Welcome to Wouldn't Dream of It. I call this week's dream, Friends Until the End. I was working in some sort of humongous automotive shopping mall. The place was literally the size of a mall, but was 100% dedicated to the building and repair of all sorts of vehicles. The center of the mall featured tricked out hot rods, some for sale and some just on display. The storefronts featured various types of things that auto enthusiasts might need for fixing up cars, such as engine parts, transmission parts, maintenance items, wheels and tires, paint and professional painting equipment, etc. I worked in a dingy wing of this weird mall where there was no foot traffic except people coming to the counter where returns and defective items were processed. The guy working at the defect desk with me had been my friend since childhood, and we were inseparable. My friend, who I'll call Scott, and I had been born on the same day, our mothers meeting and bonding at the window where they could look at us in the hospital nursery. Now Scott had a terminal illness, and when we weren't working, I was caring for him. Scott's illness had been loosely associated with his work at the automotive mall, but the connection wasn't definite enough to force them to pay for his health care. Because our employer didn't offer health care coverage, Scott continued to work in an attempt to finance his treatments. One day while we were working, a particular order required me to find an extremely tiny belt to replace a defective one. The parts area was bigger than a typical warehouse store, like Lowe's or Costco, and the placement of things didn't always make sense. It took me what felt like days to find the belt, which turned out to be about the size of a standard rubber band. Scott didn't look so great when I returned with a stupid little belt. Later, I guess at the end of our shift, Scott and I were in a vehicle, and I vaguely remember that we were fleeing from someone. I never saw who or what was in pursuit of us, but I felt that urgency that I remembered from childhood when playing hide-and-seek. Out of nowhere, we took time to stop driving so that I could go for a job interview. We were hoping that I could get this new job that paid more money so that Scott could work part-time. The interview was in a local office, but it turned out they were actually interviewing for a job in Vermont. The interview went well, but I wasn't sure I could take a job that required relocation while caring for Scott. I went back out to the vehicle where Scott was waiting, only now, instead of an enclosed vehicle, the vehicle was a motorcycle. I was concerned about Scott's ability to operate a motorcycle because his illness had weakened him, but we didn't have time to argue about who would drive. We had to get moving before we were caught. The motorcycle raced along a twisty mountain road as Scott attempted to lose our boogeyman. It was very dark that night. It must have been the new moon, and there was a very slight rain that was almost a mist. As we entered a switchback turn that I knew we wouldn't successfully navigate, the motorcycle tires slipped. Scott and I both instinctively leaned against gravity as the bike tried to drop to the road, and he almost regained control. Overcorrecting as the bike came upright again, the front tire caught under a well-meaning guardrail, and Scott and I were launched into the open air over darkened treetops and whatever lay beneath. A dream of sickness suggests discord and trouble in your life. It may also be a sign that you need healing, mentally, physically, or emotionally. I have been thinking recently that I hang on to all the traumatic events in my life as if my identity is wrapped up in them. What if it was just me, and not all of the events that shaped me?
that might be really cool. When a dream features coworkers that are not the dreamer's real coworkers, they can signal that the dreamer may have some psychological business that needs attention. This seems to further support the dream of sickness interpretation, so I don't think it really needs any commentary. Dreaming one's own death, which I thought must be a bad omen, actually predicts the release of one's worries. This bodes well for letting go of the past, right? Searching for and finding something in a dream predicts a happy new relationship. That must mean a new friendship since I'm not in the market for a romantic relationship. I did reconnect with several beloved friends at my high school reunion recently, so maybe this indicates that one of those friendships will flourish going forward. Zolar tells us that being at work in a dream indicates that, quote, a mountain of past experience has molded your views and actions, end quote. I think that reinforces once again the idea that perhaps I can remain who I am, but let go of the actual traumas. Working hard foretells that the dreamer will receive some sort of kudos if they apply their energy to achieving a goal. I have many goals, big and small. And at this time, I am applying energy to all of them. Well, maybe not all of them. I'm not applying much energy to my multiple unfinished crochet projects. <laughs> to dream that you're in an interview can denote dissatisfaction with some part of yourself. This resonates with me. I almost didn't attend my amazing high school reunion last weekend because of all my, quote, COVID weight. <laughs> Sure, it all came from being cooped up during the pandemic. Alternatively, going on an interview can mean that some money is coming. Hopefully, it'll be enough to get me out of credit card debt. Yeah, that'll happen. Here comes the less than pleasant news of this dream. Riding in a vehicle in a dream can forewarn the dreamer of impending loss or illness. Worse, being thrown from a vehicle can mean that unpleasant news is coming fast. Conversely, riding a motorcycle as a passenger might hint at a new friendship with a member of the opposite sex. Christopher, I think this means you! <laughs> oh, Christopher is a friend that I'm very excited to be back in touch with. The interpretation of this dream was a mix of the positive and the negative. All I can say is that I will give you, my dear listeners, an update about whatever unfolds. This week's lucky numbers are brought to you by the dream image of a motorcycle. They are 3, 15, 19, 23, 41, 44. Once again, that's 3, 15, 19, 23, 41, and 44. Halloween will be upon us in a few days. Since the veil between the living and the dead is said to be the thinnest at this time, I thought it would be appropriate to discuss superstitions regarding dying and the dead. Although none of this is to be taken too seriously, I think that conversations about death and the afterlife can normalize discussions on this topic, possibly taking some of the fear out of our own mortality. Some of us have had a loved one who was close to death but just kept hanging on. I've heard those near death say that they're ready and they don't understand why they're still here in the physical world. There are some beliefs that I might try if I'm ever in the company of such a person again. If they don't work, no harm done, and if they do work, the person will be at peace sooner for these things having been tried. The first of these is the belief that while a person has knots on or around their body, they cannot die. In fact, some people have been known to wear protective amulets featuring a tied knot to prevent death. All knots on or around the person's deathbed must be untied. Next, there is the belief that all locks and bolts near the person must be unlocked, and windows and doors must be opened. This will allow the soul to be freed from the body. A final belief regards the direction of the deathbed in relation to the floorboards. 
If the bed is perpendicular to the floorboards, this will prevent the sole from departing the body. Moving the bed so that it is facing parallel to the floorboards will allow the person to pass peacefully. Cemeteries, where many Americans will have their remains interred after death, are the origin of too many superstitions to cover in this episode. The one that I found most interesting is that the first body to be buried in a cemetery is claimed by the devil. So strong was this belief in Germany that it became customary to bury an animal in any new churchyard as a sacrifice to the devil. If this was not done, families would not allow their loved ones to be buried in the churchyard or cemetery. I just hope that the animal that was buried died a natural death. Although graveyards tend to be very quiet places, the souls actually are quite active. The soul of the most recently buried person must hang around and keep watch over the neighboring graves until another comes along to replace them. Most souls don't hang around the cemetery once their duty to guard the graves is done, but those that do will be looking for another soul to guide them into the afterlife. If these earthbound souls deem another soul to be the type suitable for leadership, they will gravitate toward that soul in search of solace. The grass atop the graves of these leaders may seem sparse, even if it has been well tended. Flowers will grow unbidden on the grave of a person who brought joy to the world during their life. These wildflowers are said to have been placed on the grave by earthbound angels as a reward for the person's goodness. Weeds will find their way to the grave if the person beneath the ground caused pain and sadness during their life. These weeds will be persistent regardless of how much TLC the grave receives from those who attend to it. Speaking of flowers, because roses are symbols of love, they are thought to be absolutely vile to any ill-meaning spirit that lurks in the cemetery. Roses will keep those demons at bay and attract angels who will ultimately provide the guidance that the soul needs to escape the physical world and move on to whatever lies beyond. When a graveside funeral is held, the people in attendance feel some level of misery with a few exceptions, but a downpour of rain can really magnify those feelings. Superstition tells us that if a downpour begins during the service, this is angels mourning because the soul of the person being buried is headed for Hades. The angels are so sad that they can't hold back their tears, which soak those humans at the service. If you are attending such a service and rain begins, watch and listen for lightning and thunder, which turn the downpour of rain into a good omen. Superstition holds that the thunderstorms are the tantrums of the residents of Hades. Why are they throwing tantrums? They're angry because the soul of the recently departed is not headed for their nasty little hottie hell. <laughs> Do you like what I did there? <laughs> Nobody really wants to have or plan a funeral, but when planning for one, definitely avoid holding it on All Hallows' Eve, October 31st. Why, you may ask? Most of us already know that on Halloween, the veil between life and death is believed to be at its thinnest. People who practice the dark arts tell us that funerals attract the creepier spirits that can pierce the veil on this day. Supposedly, these ghouls will go to great lengths to convince freshly freed souls that they know the way to the afterlife. The soul of the person being buried may still be confused about what has happened, and if these fiends persuade the flummoxed new soul to follow them, they could find themselves unexpectedly dealing with the horrors of Hades. To protect your loved one from this happening, whether you believe in it or not, maybe avoid the 24-hour period known as Halloween for their funeral. I don't know. I kind of hope that when my time comes, I cross over on Halloween, or at least on a dark and gloomy day. So people have done what they can by not holding funerals on Halloween. What if spirits continue to be discombobulated about having shuffled off the mortal coil? Well, they will hang around the cemetery pondering their next move. 
These spirits will be attracted to whistling, singing, or music of any kind. If a living person passes the cemetery while making or playing music of any sort, these spirits will follow until the sound stops. If the musically inclined individual passes a cemetery and does not fall silent before the cemetery is out of sight, they will find themselves being accompanied by uninvited guests. While we can't be sure whether it is actually a bad thing to be followed home, perhaps it is best to avoid introducing a confused spirit to your home. If the cemetery is already out of sight, some superstitions recommend making a few stops before going home so as to confuse the spirits and cause them to remain behind in one of the locations where you stop. In some cultures, people believe that while passing a cemetery, one can even inhale a spirit that is looking to find the normalcy of a physical body again. This means that not only should you not whistle or sing near a graveyard, you should actually hold your breath as you pass. This is one of those situations where an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. But personally, I've explored many cemeteries extensively, and as far as I know, I've never breathed in a spirit. Then again, look at the podcast I'm making. (laughs) A tradition that many Americans practice but probably do not understand is the gathering at a restaurant after a funeral. As superstition has it, lost spirits are drawn by the sadness of the mourners and will sometimes latch on to them. These spirits will hang on tight, hoping to return to life in the physical world. If the grieving person does not want to take the spirit to their home, their best strategy is to gather with other mourners in a crowded restaurant after the service. The spirit will be further confused by the mayhem of the restaurant, and the mourner is likely to lose the specter in the crowd. Those funeral goers who choose to skip the restaurant are advised to make several stops on the way home so that they can lose any parasitic spirits. It has been said that walking on the grave of a loved one can place one's entire family in danger of being haunted by the spirits that lurk in the cemetery. I guess the lingering spirits demand respect for the dead, even if the spirit of the person in the grave has passed on. Some people believe that when a living person suddenly shivers, an animal has walked over that person's future grave. Some believe that any animal passing over one's future grave can cause a shiver. Others believe that only geese cause this phenomenon. As a person who plans to have some alternative to burial after my death, I wonder what it's supposed to mean if I suddenly shiver. I've considered donating my body to a body farm, cremation, or water cremation, which is also known as aquamation. But whatever I choose, it will not be a traditional burial with me stuffed into a box with satin cushions. By the way, if you want to learn more about all things death-related in a friendly, humorous context, check out the podcast Obituary and let them know that you learned about them from Wouldn't Dream of It. Spencer and Madison's were influences for me as the idea of my podcast was beginning to take root. Speaking of taking root, this week's Upworthy News story teaches us about companion planting, courtesy of Ashley Nicole's Mom Jeans and Garden Things blog. Nicole says that she always puts together three components to make her plants healthy and to keep critters that will ruin your plants or your crop away. The three components are the main crop, the flower, and the herb. One of Nicole's pots contains a tomato plant as the main crop, onions, chives, and oregano as herbs, which will help repel pests, and marigold as the flower, which is also a repellent of pests. I think, in fact, that marigold is a deterrent for deer, which is a big problem for gardens in my area. This method has worked well for Nicole and those who have tried her recommendations. This definitely works for a container garden, and with a little bit of extra planning, I think you could make it work in a full-sized containerless garden as well. In my show notes, you'll find a link to the story. And in that story, there's also a link to Nicole's blog. While you're checking out her companion gardening, you might want to check out her tips, tricks, and ideas on ways to grow your own herbal beauty routine. 
I know I'm going to go check it out right now. Creating this content for you is a dream come true for me, so your support means more than you know. Please tell everyone who will listen to you about Wouldn't Dream of It so that we can keep growing. Leaving five-star reviews on your favorite podcast platforms will help us reach more listeners who might enjoy or even benefit from the show. If you can spare a few bucks to help the show get even better, there's a donate button on my website at www.rss.com forward slash podcasts forward slash wouldn't hyphen dream hyphen of hyphen it. Every little bit helps. Wooden Dream of It is produced, written, and edited by me, Eliza Jones. Marketing assistance provided by Lapis Hale and Leah Wade. Original song, Dreams and Nightmares by Twisted. That's Twisted with a Y. Find them on Facebook as Twisted Twisted, both with a Y instead of an I. Connect with us on social media at Wooden Dream of It. That's usually wouldn't without the apostrophe. Email your dreams to me at wouldn'tdreamofit at gmail.com and your dreams could be featured on a future show. Be sure to check my show notes for a complete list of references used to create this podcast. Thanks for listening. I'll talk to you next week.